Well, good afternoon, uh, Professor Shaikh, um, Anwar Shaikh. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to meet you here, and um, we're going to have a discussion about your work, um, your theoretical work, your political work. And um, first of all, I, I think it, it's worthwhile to start with your intellectual biography. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, like how you developed into the intellectual that you are today? Yes, well, first let me thank you for the invitation here. This conference has been really excellent. And uh, I, as I mentioned in my uh, first, in my session, one of the things that motivated me to become an economist was a confrontation between the levels of development uh, that I perceived as my family moved across the world and the discrepancy between what I perceived and what seemed to me could be done. Um, my early training was as an engineer, so I tended to have the attitude that if there's a problem, you can fix it. But that led me to study economics, and then I discovered to my shock that economics didn't really portray the world adequately, and therefore the fix becomes a problem because you're starting from a foundation which is already uh, misrepresenting the world. Um, that led me to graduate school, and in graduate school I encountered political movements. Uh, there was a strong anti-war movement in the United States at that time and a, a pro-civil rights, pro-feminist rights, women's rights. So it was a very progressive time and it led me to question what I was being taught as a student and to read more widely and more generally about how the world actually worked rather than how it was misrepresented within economic theory. Yeah. So you, um, you're, you're an economist, you come from a department that is um, uh, particularly non-pluralist in, in many ways, that many of the heterodox approaches to political economy actually exist outside of the economics department. And um, until at least the crisis, you had the situation that um, the methods of you know, the abstract, mathematized, um, equilibrium theory-based methods actually uh, infiltrated or, or influenced um, many social sciences, political right. science in particular, right. game theory, etc. Um, but uh, the crisis kind of changed things uh, in a way that you had um, revolts against um, neoclassical economics um, insofar as it didn't explain the crisis and but for you it was um, it was political movements actually that got you interested in different models not the well, inefficiency to explain. Yeah, that's an interesting question because actually when I was uh, first studying economics you have to remember that the economics profession was broader uh, and more open than it is now because there was a time when Keynesian economics was still taken as a serious economic school. So, and that in itself was interesting because Keynesian economics had come into power because of the failure of the orthodox economists to understand what the Great Depression was about. And that led to a, a big opening, but by the uh, early 70s that opening was closing down and by the 80s it had shut down completely. I however had already been exposed to that opening and I was fortunate actually to read the work of uh, the man who would later become my colleague Robert Heilbrenner in a book called The Worldly Philosophers and there I discovered that economics had always had a grand set of uh, different visions of which neoclassical economics was the smallest, so to speak, in my opinion, intellectually the smallest and least interesting. And yet that was all that I was being taught. And so that spurred my interest in all these different ideas. And because I was also lucky that I ended up teaching at the New School, which was a very progressive institution founded in the early 20th century by progressives who had left Columbia University, and created their own school, and then later by progressive scholars coming from Europe with the rise of the Nazis, and that meant that I was fortunate to be in an internationalist, progressive environment as an economist rather than someone outside of economics. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
mean, as, as Germans, most people know that, that Herbert Marcuse was, of course, was at, at the new school uh, yes. himself. But um, so you, um, you were exposed or you grew up in a situation where the economics departments were strongly influenced by Keynesianism and Keynesianism was also economics the profession. profession. The profession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was also um, until the crisis of Fordism, the, the dominant economic policy, um, anti-cyclical. But you also, um, you didn't stick with, with Keynesianism, um, but you um, also developed and you have developed over the recent years a, a fundamental critique also of um, the heterodox approaches uh, yeah. within political economy. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about why you, um, what the critique is? Well, what I observed coming from uh, travels across different parts of the world is that people behave differently and in complicated ways. I mean, no one can study history without understanding the role of culture and institutions and emotions and angers and uh, sacrifice and violence, all of these things. And so when I was introduced to the foundations of economic analysis in the traditional sense with optimizing and maximizing, it seemed to me a completely absurd way to start and kind of indeed an insulting way to start to represent human behavior that way. It was certainly not true in as European human behavior, it wasn't true of any. But I also observed that many of my uh, heterodox colleagues accepted that as representing something that was in the past and was not true any longer. And that seemed to me a trap. Because if you take a foundational view of something being true in the past and you see the present as being imperfect, which is how many uh, ortho, uh, heterodox economists go, imperfect competition, concentration, monopoly power, uh, then you're trapped in the framework of perfection. So that led me to investigate from the start, uh, how can we start with a different foundation? Now, I, I, my early years in graduate school, I also studied anthropology because that seemed to me the right place to begin when you're talking about uh, people's behavior and psychology and political science. But then the question is, how do you put that together in an economic analysis? And that took me some time to show that you can go from the foundations of how people behave all the way up to the macroeconomic patterns and market patterns of how capitalism behaves in a systematic fashion. And I didn't want this to be just a book of axioms. I wanted the, my book to be, my, my work to be grounded in empirical analysis because in the end, if you're going to uh, do a project of this sort, you have to be able to show that it's capable of understanding what really happens. So I think of it as there's an opposition on one side between perfect uh, competition, perfect economics, and imperfect economics. In my view, they're tied together. And I prefer to call what I'm doing real economics, that is economics that's grounded in the actual behavior. I should say that is not a new thing, because that is how Adam Smith approaches capitalism. It is how Ricardo approaches it, how Marx approaches it, and in my opinion, also how Keynes approaches it. And once we understand that there is a, a big tradition of the, the best economists of, of, of the profession, of, of, the, of the pantheon, so to speak, who are already doing this, we don't have to feel that we're doing something outside. We're actually doing something that was the majority until neoclassical economics became dominant. Yeah. So, like, I mean, if, if one were to... to categorize um, or pigeonhole the various, um, um, like in the history of economic thought, um, uh, could probably say that you have um, like the, the classical political economy, which uh, Marx ended up being, you know, like saying that he was um, better at explaining the origin of profit, for instance, mm -hmm. as opposed to Smith and, and Ricardo. And then you had the neoclassical onslaught against, against Marx. And that ever, whenever there were crises, it seems that you, you get a tendency or a, a current of thought that, um, and that's why I found your work particularly in, interesting, um, that starts with the, the, the market, has it as its original premise, but then adds a, a lot of um, uh, exceptions to, to the rule. Then, like if you, for instance, read Max Weber, it seems that he, he has like 
thousands of explanations why the market isn't working as it is working, right. but it, he sticks to it as as like the the original premise to to the way he's thinking and I th it seems that whenever there's crises you have economists going back to history and looking at culture and and all those social environments right. and and language but you're um, I, I was just surprised that you excluded Keynes from that particular um, category of say of say institutional political economy from John Stuart Mill maybe via Max Weber to K Keynes right. Galbraith maybe Stieglitz today that's right um, why would you exclude Keynes? Because I think Keynes was posing a fundamental question which is not institutional, but fundamental to the structure of the market itself, which is the uh, better way to put it is the effect of a big stimulation of the economy on the economy itself. Now, the problem goes back earlier. Uh, Marx has a discussion about the effect of the discovery of gold mines, mines in California as the gold was discovered and flowed from California across the west, uh, across, from the west to the east, and then from the east to Europe, uh, this was a problem investigated by Thomas Took. What happened to the uh, European economies with this huge influx of purchasing power? What we would call now a massive stimulus. Well, the classical argument from Ricardo uh, and was the idea that it would just cause prices to rise. But we observed that instead, the main effect was that it caused quantities to rise. It caused employment and growth. So Marx already remarks upon the fact that capitalism by its nature is capable of responding to a stimulus. But that discussion is not there in Marx's own work because mm -hmm. most of his work is unfinished. He didn't, in fact, live to do most of what we consider to be his work. It was put together by Engels yeah. after his death. So that raises the question in the classical tradition, how do you understand the uh, responsiveness of the system to a stimulus? And Keynes is the one who poses that problem as fundamental, and Kaletsky also. But mm -hmm. really, Keynes is the most conscious of the break but the difficulty for Keynes is that he has nowhere to go with this understanding beyond the macro level because he's trying to, whether consciously or unconsciously, find a connection between his macro policies and the micro theory of the people that he was opposing. Mm. And that contradiction meant that Keynes was then able to be pulled back into the framework by their saying, look, he himself says he's one of us. And yes, so we will make him one of us by adding some imperfections. Keynesian economics becomes an imperfection. From my point of view, Keynesian economics is about a fundamental property of the system, which is a, I don't like the word perfection, but it's in effect a real uh, uh, characteristic of the system, that it's responsive to a stimulus, whether the stimulus is the printing of money mm -hmm. or the discovery of gold. But then the issue is, what is the limit to that from the classical side? How does that have something that creates uh, factors that overturn it or damp it down or cause consequences that are unintended? So uh, I, I saw this some time ago, but the issue was how to go from a systematic framework that can explain the behavior of individual markets, microeconomics, all the way to the macro and explain the patterns that you actually observe without using any of the foundations of orthodox economics. No maximizing, no utility, no perfect knowledge, no rational expectations, no equilibrium in the traditional sense of, of being a state of existence. And so you have to have a, a, a starting point that can encompass the real processes and you need different tools, different math, different methodology, but in the end, you have to address the same patterns. Yeah, this is interesting because, um, uh, as you know, within the, the Marxist political economy tradition, um, like there seem to be those who say that um, Marx was actually writing a categorical critique of classical political economy, that he was criticizing the, the, the concepts themselves, but did not... Um, try to to supersede those, um, whereas others are saying no. He was um, actually um, in the classical political economy tradition. He tried to be the better classical political economist, um, um, and you seem to side with with that tradition that that um, one has to develop, um, like one actually has to solve the transition problem and and things like that. So 
Yes, but you see, I think the problem is that what unifies Marx with the classical economists is the idea that they're analyzing the real world, capitalism itself. And a critique of the foundations of somebody else's approach will not give you that analysis. Marx spent a huge amount of time studying the behavior of prices, relative prices, productivity, technology, land rent, wages, uh, labor conditions. He spent time understanding these so he could show how he could explain what was happening as being intrinsic to the system. So as you, if you're a philosopher, you can talk about the critique of the classical tradition and you can talk about Marx's foundational break with it. But if you're an economist and someone says to you, so how does that explain whether there should be austerity or stimulus in Europe, in Greece? What, what can you say? You can't just throw out the tropes of, infl of exploitation and alienation. That's not going to help. You have to be able to answer the same questions. And I think not only it's very clear that Marx tried to do that, that his work focuses on those patterns, but it's also clear that he didn't finish writing what he projected to do. Yeah. And so that was a task. And by the way, when he leaps to Engels, he says, well, look, Fred, you're going to have to finish up this work, which I didn't do, and I'm sure that my followers will be able to understand this foundation and take it on to the proper development of political economy, but they didn't do that. Yeah. Well, they didn't. Well, I mean, he, like in April 58, he had that project of writing six books, which would have included a book about the international market and, exactly, and the state yes. and so on and so forth. Wages and, yes. Um, but to come back, like, I want to uh, ask you a little bit about those, th those things as well, but to come back, so it, some people would have said that, say, the, the main interest or research interest of Marx was to analyze why not why that particular price um, but why that particular social form of organizing an economy but you would say you need both or there oh, is absolutely. both in, I, I, in Marx I, I, well. anyway I deny it's absolutely that Marx was only interested in one side one of the things that happens with Marx uh, this is an analogy I use I may not have the, the exact numbers here but when Newton was working on the law of gravity he came to a stunning uh, realization that you could unify these in the idea that uh, two masses are attracted towards each other and that the uh, size of the masses determine the gravitational force between them. And so he could explain why I, we could take a, 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 a ping pong ball, a, a table tennis ball and a golf ball and in the absence of air, drop them, they would drop to the ground at the same rate. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing to understand. However, he had a problem. Outside, the earth is the golf ball, the moon is a table tennis ball, and it's hanging there and is not coming down. And Newton was faced with the difficulty that if his argument was correct, he could explain why apples fall from the tree to the ground, but he couldn't explain why the moon didn't fall to the earth. Now, it took him the development of calculus, and I, I recall it 12, 13 years, some number like that, before he realized that if the two objects are moving relative to each other, they can be in an orbit. Now, suppose that Newton had died before he did that. Suppose he had died only with the apples falling to the ground, then his followers would have split into two parts. Those parts who say, mm -hmm. well, he was interested only in the fundamentals, the basic laws, and that he really didn't care about the moon and apples, it was just his point of entry. Or the other side would say, well, we need a different principle for that. So maybe we start with Newton, maybe we don't, but we need some way to explain why a big object doesn't fall. And Newton was conscious of the, the danger, so to speak, of a half-finished theory. Unfortunately, we have for Marx a half-finished exposition. Not a half-finished analysis, in my opinion. He did a lot of that work but a half-finish exposition, and it split the movement precisely in that expected way. Some went to the idea that, that Marx was only interested in a foundational critique, but not interested in the vulgar things like prices and interest rates and exchange rates, but we know that's not true because mm -hmm. Marx spent a lot of time commenting and writing about that. And others would say, well, the ideas that Marx put forward are no longer true because he was talking about competition, 
and we don't have competition, now we have monopoly, and so they move on to the idea that we have to explain the moon in a different way. I've always argued that both of those are mistakes, that there was a path. After Tony Blair, no one can ever say a third way, but there is another <laughs> path that uh, can unify these. The starting point, the elements which were laid out, and show that it's capable of explaining much more than was actually used or developed in the in in the classical tradition. Yeah. And uh, Marx's followers, they try to actually develop the the or fill the lacunae in in, in Marx's work. Um, for instance, like Hilferding with this book on financial capital, or or Luxembourg with a book on the accumulation of capital. Um, but in in your work, you're not. I mean, Luxembourg has has seen a sort of. Um, um, like a renewed interest in her work, particularly mm -hmm. because of her, her Landnahme theor theorem, um, like the idea that um, there needs to be an external to, mm -hmm. to, to capital, only that she was wrong thinking that it had to lay outside of the external mm -hmm. borders of nation states, mm -hmm. but that it could actually be like the New Deal, be inside of existing social formations. Mm -hmm. um, but Luxembourg hasn't influenced your work as much. You're drawing a lot on... on no, I, 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 let me say two things. Uh, I, before I wrote this book, which took me 15 years, I spent 10 years on another book, which was about the movement from Marx to Hilferding and Luxembourg, and I still have that unfinished manuscript. I did, I threw it away. I mean, it's hanging around, but I didn't use it. And I didn't use it because that manuscript focused on the incompleteness or problematics of each of these people mm -hmm. in relation to Marx. It became a book about concepts, but not about the issues involved. When I read Hilferding, for instance, and Finance Capital, two things seem to me very important posed there. One is, is it true that there is monopoly? And you have to, when I read that book, I say, how do you know that it's monopoly? And the answer is because firms are big. But big firms, concentration, centralization, is not in Marx a source of monopoly. It's a mechanism for competition. Mm -hmm. However, if you're starting from orthodox economics, perfect competition, then the fact that firms have any scale at all is an indication of imperfection. So what had crept into the Marxist tradition was already the nascent dominant uh, ideology of capitalism, the perfection ideology, and it's absolutely dominant today. Um, uh, the Monthly Review School people mm. have recently published, I mentioned in my book, mm. their, their notion of what competition is, and they say, well, it's the same as Milton Friedman. Well, that's an astonishing yeah. statement from a Marxist group because if they've read anything in Marx, it's all about the, the fact that competition is the operative principle that regulates capitalism. Yeah. So when I read Luxembourg, it was a different question. Luxembourg's question was, what about effective demand? What is the place in Marx's scheme? And she focuses on the schemes of reproduction and says, well, where does the demand come from? I, took, I read that very carefully, and I did a lot of work on it, actually, at one point. And I realized that the problem was twofold. One is, how is the system able to finance growth? And that's a kind of externality, especially if, uh, if the growth is going to be beyond the internal mechanism system. And the second is, how does the system respond to a stimulus of effective demand? And that leads you pretty much to Kaletsky and mm -hmm. Keynes, which is where Kaletsky says he comes from, Luxembourg anyway. But then that's disconnected from the other laws. It appears only as a problem at the aggregate level, but surely that cannot be true. Every of these problems appears at the level of the micro. So I try to show that you can stitch these problems together, you can answer them, but not necessarily in the way they were posed either by Hilferding or Luxembourg. Uh, for instance, in the book I show about finance capital, I, I have a discussion of how finance capital can be treated analytically. Yes, <laughs> thank you for holding it up. <laughs> Please buy that book. <laughs> you will see it's quite heavy. It's, it's not easy to hold up. Um, and here is another problem that comes up. Uh, most Marxist tradition uh, focus on the idea that profit comes from surplus value. What I point out in the book is that Marx makes the argument that it doesn't, and people ignore that. And the reason is very simple. 
before industrial capitalism, there was 2,000 years of merchant capitalism, not a system in itself, but in some countries and some areas, big trading families, big trading regions. Where did the profits come from for those trading regions? They didn't, didn't have manufacturers to do it. They went abroad, they took things from here, took them to China By or Arabia, side, yeah. and they brought back other things. So that was an exchange of unequal exchange in the sense of Marx, which produces profit. In, in the beginning of that chapter on profit, in, I mentioned that uh, I start with Stewart, Sir James Stewart, who says there are two sources of profit. And this is the first section of theories of surplus value of Marx. Part one, uh, chapter one, he discusses say, James, Sir James Stewart's idea that there are two sources of profit. And Marx says, Stuart doesn't explain where the second modern profit comes from, which I, Marx, will. That's going to be surplus value. Mm -hmm. But he's right that there is another profit, which I'm going to call profit on transfer or profit on alienation. And that's going to become important later when I get to the, the, the distribution. The of course, we know he doesn't get to it. But that clue is very important because it's also the source of explaining many problems, such as a transformation problem, the appearance or disappearance of profit relative to surplus value, as well as financial capital, as well as trading capital. Yeah. So I try to show that the same principle operates to explain um, the, the particular problems, but the principle has different moments, so to speak. There's a production of profit and there's a creation of profit through transfer. And that solves a lot of problems that appear otherwise to be unrelated to the main argument.